Churches, we're rolling along into uh, the Easter season, man, and we are rolling along into it. We're, we are starting a brand new sermon series for this month. It's entitled Easter Peeps. Now, we're not going to be talking about those colorful uh, marshmallow peeps that some of you love and some of you think is absolutely disgusting. We actually have um, a box of marshmallow peeps at our house. We've had them for three years now, and I decided that... Uh, me and Mary's going to flip a coin who's going to eat them because I was going to make her because I thought she bought them, but she says I did. So we're going to flip a coin, so uh, be praying for us on that one. But this month, we're going to be looking at some of the key people involved in the Easter story that we call the resurrection and how each and every one of us can relate to all of them. See, church, in John chapter 11, if you'll look at this with me, it says this, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Is what he said. Today, the individual that we're going to pick out of the resurrection story, and I really hope that you pay attention and get this today, it's Mary Magdalene. And the fact of who she was and, and how God used her in a mighty way. So if you'll turn with me to Mark chapter 16. Man, I got lots of verses for you today. That is not an apology. You are in church. You should be thankful you get to hear a lot of that. But in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7, just follow along with me as I read. It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And as they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white in a robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Church, I want you to realize and understand today that story that I just read you right there, that is the center, that is the core, that is the basis of every single thing that we believe as Christians. I'm talking church, this is the big show, this is the greatest show, and you might be sitting there right now and thinking, preacher, like you should never call this a show, and I want to tell you, the reason you're saying that is because you're thinking of TV shows. Man, this is the resurrection of the dead, church. The resurrection of the dead, the cornerstone of what we believe, it's the hope that each and every one of us we go to our grave with, it's what will bring us through the valley of the shadow of death, church, this is our victory, and as I call it a show, I want to make sure you understand, if you look up the word show in Webster's Dictionary, it is defined this way, a display, typically an impressive one, a spectacle. It was a spectacle. You know, when my mom, when we were growing up, she would take us to the store, and, and God bless her, she would take us all at once. And I remember her telling us, before we get in there, she said, you don't touch nothing, you don't ask for nothing, and if you make a spectacle out of yourself, it's going to be bad. She was a pro at this. And that word spectacle, what she meant is she said, don't you go in there and make a scene, basically, right? But you know what, church? Paul referred to the resurrection as a spectacle. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, he said this, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Church, what that means is he took the dark powers and he drugged them along. He made a spectacle out of them because he overcame the grave. So the resurrection of Christ is our hope, and anything else, church, is in vain. So for this show, the resurrection... Mary Magdalene, she had what I guess we could call a front row seat. I mean, she was right there. She was the first one to see the resurrection of Jesus. And so today, what I want to do is I want to talk about how and why. How and why Mary was the one who, who got to see this. Church, it wasn't a fluke thing. I'm a guy, I do not believe in coincidences. I don't believe in flukes. I don't believe in luck. I believe that we serve a God, that he orchestrates it all. He is a purposeful God, and he knows what he's doing. 
So there was a reason that Mary was the first one to see the resurrection. And I believe personally it was because of a faithful life. She lived a faithful life. Of the life that she lived, once Christ gave her that brand new life, once she was set free. So let's go back to her start. If you'll look with me in Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8 verse 1 says this, after this Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him. Verse two says this, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. So church, when you think about Jesus, we naturally think about his crew, right? Like his support team. It's instant. Oh, 12 disciples. They hung out with him. They went from town to town. They they, they traveled and preached the good news. And you just know that. These guys rolled with him. It was the 12 that was with him from the beginning. But see, how did Jesus and his 12 disciples get to go and do all these things? When you just read that verse right there, it just says, yeah, Jesus traveled from one town, village, to another, proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God, and his disciples was with him. In church, that's neat. But think about this. They had to have ways to do this, Right? There had to be ways and means. He had a support system. Verse 3 says this. He talked about, verse 2, he talked about Mary Magdalene, seven demons cast at her. She was with him. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. These ladies, certain women, they were helping to support The fact that Jesus and his guys, they were going from town to town. I mean, buying the food. I mean, hey, we'll get you lodging. They were taking care of these things. And see, every single one of these girls, they had a a backstory too. Mary, as it said there in verse 2, it says, Mary called Magdalene. She had seven demons come out of her. Seven demons. And then it says they provided for him. From their substance. Church, think about this. Luke is pointing to these women. These women and and, and who we will say they they served the ministry. They served the ministry and helped promote that. And Luke points it out that all these women said, we'll serve. We will serve so that you can go do ministry. See, for Mary, it wasn't a fluke wasn't a coincidence that she had that front row seat to see all this stuff. It started, church, it started all the way back to where Mary had hit rock bottom. I'm talking rock bottom, and then Jesus touched her. He healed, he healed her. So I want to go back to John for, for a different perspective. I want to go back to John for a different account of what happened. So in the beginning there, I gave you some of Mark's, you know, you can read. If you got ADHD, if you do, Mark's the gospel you want to read because it's quick. Boom, right to the point. You don't get lost in there. You know, Mark just hands it right out. And if you know anything, a lot of biblical scholars says that Mark's point of view was actually Peter's thoughts. So Peter's like, hey, Mark, come over here and write this down for me. And so, so that's what biblical scholars believe. And Mark was quick and to the point, and, and he always likes to say, and then So he was running these sentences on, we went here, and then we did this, and then we did that. That's what Mark does. But see, John's a lot more detailed, church. John gives you some details about what's going on, and Mary ended up, here's what I love. Mary ended up at the tomb with an angel encounter, but she started with demons being possessed. She ran the whole rope, didn't she? From beginning to the end. Check it out with me. If you look at John chapter 20, turn there. That's where most of our texts are going to come from today. John chapter 20, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. Remember, John's a detail guy. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Now, I want to stop right there. John is the one who wrote this. And he says, you know, Peter was there, and he refers to himself as the one Jesus loved. So he's saying, you know what? Peter was here, and the Lord loved me so much. I was his favorite, 
right? So he, he's kind of looking at it. So listen to this. Say, so, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple, meaning John, he's talking about himself, he started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So here he is. John's bragging, Peter, you're slow. Basically what he said. I loved him more than you. I made it there first. So he's talking about Jesus loved me a lot. And I was the first one in the tomb because, you, you know, you ate too many Twinkies. It took you a while to get there, buddy. Check out verses 5 through 9. It says, he bent over and he looked at the strips of linen lying there but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, so he's saying, you know what, Peter, he just stormed right in there. I was being, this is the grave, right? I didn't want to desecrate nothing. Finally, the other disciple would reach the tomb first. There he's telling you one more time, I made it there first. Peter, you're slow. Also went inside. He saw and he believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then it goes on in verses 10 through 12. It says this. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying and she wept and she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. Church, listen, Mary, the other disciples took off. He ain't here. Let's go. Mary stayed there. She was crying and weeping for the one that she loved. Check out verses 13 through 15. It says, they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking that he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, you tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Mary is devastated. She said, I want to know where he's at. I'll go carry him back. 16 through 17, check this out. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Church, I want you to get it here. We now have a perspective of this woman. We have a perspective of this woman. It, she wasn't lucky to have a front row seat. For the most important day of history, literally, this is the most important day of history, she got to be the first person in history, church, who got to send out the message of the resurrection. The very first one. The message of hope, church, for any single person that needs it. You know, he's like, you tell my brethren, you tell my disciples, and Peter too, right? She got to be the first one to go out and say, Jesus is alive. What a privilege, church. She even got to go, hey, Peter, you know what? I know you feel like a failure because you messed a lot of stuff up. But it's okay because he's here. See, the angel specifically told me to tell you, Peter. So what went in to make this epic day for this woman? What is it that, that, that brought all of this to a head for that one special day? And what would do the same for you and me, church? For us. To be that privileged. See, she went from the beginning of the gospel on this journey to be poised at this exact same moment. Remember, I told you God is purposeful. He is a God. He loves to do things specifically for a reason. There is no accidents. There is no luck when it comes to God. He's purposeful, man. Even though you don't realize it all the time, he knows what he's doing. So what did Mary do right? The very first thing, I'm going to give you seven of them, man. They're going to be fast, so hang on, okay? Mary, the first thing she did was show gratitude. Mary showed gratitude. I want to take you back again to, to Luke, Luke chapter 8, verses 1. It says, after this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. 
Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons came out. And it goes on in verse 3, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of the Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So church, listen to what that is. That means she was paying for it. She was showing her gratitude. I would hope that you, I would hope that myself, that if Jesus delivered us from seven demons that was living inside of us, that we would be so gracious, that we would have so much gratitude for what he did for us. Because think about this, church. She had seven demons in her. Now, the Bible, when the Bible uses the word seven, it doesn't necessarily mean seven specific ones. A lot of times, the word seven means full, complete. Like, she was full of demons, right? She was completely overcome by those demons. She was fully given over to the prince of darkness. That could be what that means. The Bible tells us, right, that the enemy, Satan, what does he come to do, church? He comes to, like a thief, to kill, steal, and destroy. That's who he is. She believed the lies because she was under the control of the dark one. But, church, that was until Jesus found her. It was until Jesus touched her. It was until Jesus healed her. It was until Jesus gave her hope, right? He gave meaning to her life. He restored her. He changed every single thing about her. And so, of course, the Bible says that she used what she had to support his ministry because she had gratitude. She was thankful. Of course, what would she say? She's going to be like, whatever I can do. You tell me, man. Jesus, whatever I can do. She was a grateful person. And get this, church. Understand this. Grateful people. For those of us, for grateful people, What you do is you pivot and you always seek to be a blessing to somebody else. If you are truly grateful, if you are truly grateful, you you, you always seek to be a blessing to others, right? How many of you ever been to McDonald's? Today's society, we kind of call it paying forward, right? You go to McDonald's and all of a sudden you pull up there and Ruth at Wellsville, she's my girl. (laughs) Ruth Wellsville goes, hey, that guy in front of you already paid for it. You're like, what a good day. And your instinct is like, I'm putting my three bucks back in my pocket. (laughs) Score, right? And then if you're truly grateful, you're like, you know what? How much is that guy? I'm praying right now, Lord. I hope it ain't 17 bucks because I got $3 in my wallet. You take care of them too. A grateful person always seeks to be a blessing to someone else because they received a blessing. And listen, church, gratefulness is never silent. It's never silent. It's never invisible. You can't say, you don't know my heart. You don't know what's on the inside. If you are truly grateful, if you are truly grateful, it's something that you can see. Your gratefulness, it will show up. People will see it. If you're grateful, church, you'll stand up. So she gave thanks to Jesus. She was grateful. She's like, you know, how can I help, Lord? What can I do? You know, what needs to happen here? You pointed out, I'll take care of it. And she said, I want more people to be touched like I was. Lord, you did something amazing for me. I want other people to feel exactly the way I feel. I want other people to be blessed like I was blessed. So I want to help. Church, marry her whole life. After the Lord healed her, she wanted to help. You know, what I read to you, it says that Mary was coming to bring spices to the tomb. Spices were not free. They were crazy expensive back then. So on that day, she showed up with the most expensive thing that you could possibly bring. And you know what? For those of you who remember the Easter story when you're a little kid, you know, she bring us spices. So you're thinking about that, that little round McCormick bottle of cinnamon, right? Oh, I got my spices. That's it. That's all you got. No. Jewish tradition was this. Whatever a man weighed, let's say Jesus weighed 150 pounds. You had enough spices for half of his weight. That's how you properly honored someone when you wrapped them up with the spices. So listen, that girl, she brought a lot of spices. And they weren't cheap. It was the most expensive way that that you can think of. And Joseph and Nicodemus, right? 
You know, they, they gave Jesus to him. They, they hastily wrapped him up. But she wanted to do even more for her Lord. She's like, I'm going to do it right. And so she was ready. She was ready. See, in the dark, through the risk, she showed up because, church, she was grateful. The second thing that Mary was is this. She showed resilience. She showed resilience because going what she went through, being demon-possessed, she went through a lot. It would be easy for Mary to be defined by that. Do you realize that? For the rest of her life, she goes, yeah, I was the girl's demon-possessed. Church, we all know somebody. We do. We all know somebody who's been through some very difficult things, and they just can't get over it. I mean, they're out of the storm, but yet they still can't get over it, and they let themselves be defined by it. You know, they're constantly in that loop. They're constantly replaying the hurts, constantly replaying those hard times. And you would never, ever know that God brought them through something. You wouldn't know because they stay there. It's almost like they're stuck in that one spot. Please don't think that I'm minimizing what you've been through. I'm not. I'm just trying to show you what God wants to do. See, we are called as Christians to be driven. We're called to be driven. We are called not to be defined by our hardships, not to be defined by our struggles. And and you know what we're also called to do, church? When we come out of that situation, we are called to seek others out who are stuck and are lost, and you show them a better way. Because if you've been in that situation, nobody knows better. When I first started ministry at the church here, you know, people would come in and they they were addicted to drugs. And I really didn't understand. I got all kinds of vices, but that was never it. Drugs and alcohol was never my issue. You know, I'm addicted to sugar. Sugar don't destroy your family. It don't, don't, you know, make your kids live a a horrible life. It don't make you lose your job. It just makes you fat. That's it. That's on you. (laughs) But they would come in and they're like, you know, I'm dealing with this. I'd be like, just quit, man. I didn't get it because I'd never been there. You know, Kim comes along. God sent Kim Halfhill to us, and she understood. She understood what it was like. And so what it was is she realized, like, you know what? I don't want people to be stuck and lost how I was. I have come through it so I can show them a better way coming through it. See, the Bible, I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I love that story because the Bible says this, and this is a quote, they were brought through the fire. They were brought right through that fire. They, they didn't have to stay in it. They didn't cycle around in there. They were brought through the fire. And the Bible even says this, they didn't even smell like smoke. He carried them all the way through there. They weren't burnt. They didn't even smell like smoke. I mean, you, you could be around them, and you couldn't see that they went through the fire. You couldn't tell that they went through the fire. You couldn't smell them and say, you've been through the fire. No. Church, for me and you, listen to me this morning. May God help us. May God help us be the people that they can hear our testimony, that they can hear about our trials, and they'll look at you and be shocked like, I would have never known you went through that because you don't let it define you. You don't say that's who I am. See, Mary Magdalene did not have a victim mentality at all. No, you cannot be a victim and a victor at the same time, church. I want you to hear that this morning. You cannot be a victim and a victor at the same time. You're either one or the other. And this girl, Mary Magdalene, she was more than a conqueror. Through Christ Jesus, right? Did you know the name Moses means to be drawn out? The name Moses in the Bible, the the, the word for it is to be drawn out. He got his name, church, because he was drawn out of the river. But think about this. He had a really hard upbringing, if you think about it. His parents thought the safest thing they could do for him is to put him in a basket in a crocodile-infested river and just... See you later. They thought that was the safest choice. I think, of course, you know how the story goes, right? Moses was raised in the home of someone who wanted to kill him as a baby. He also, 
he had to call his real mom his nanny or his nurse. He also, the daughter, the person who wanted to kill him, he had to call her mom. (laughs) That sounds like a very expensive therapy bill to me, doesn't it? He had a lot going on there. The name Moses means drawn out. And you know what Moses did? He carried that the rest of his life. He owned his name. He owned his name. He did not let his name be put in, right? He did not let his name be called put in. So don't you let your name be put in. You let your name be drawn out or brought through. That is who you should be. We are a people, church, who've been through hard times. I believe everybody in this room, you've got some kind of hard time in your life, but heaven help us for us to be a people that's called saved. We should be called saved. We we should be called loved. We should be called redeemed. Not, not, you can't say, I was forgotten. Not to be called, I was neglected. Not to be called, I was abandoned. Not to be called, that I was taken advantage of. Not to be called divorced. Let us not take our identity through what we've been through. That's not who you are. But instead, you take your identity of what you've been called to. And that is through Christ Jesus. This is Mary, church. She was resilient. The third thing is this, Mary showed her work. I mean, she showed up to work. That's exactly who she was, right? Luke chapter 8, verse 3. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna and many others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. Her money. Let me give you a little bit about her. Magdalene was not her last name. It was not her last name. You know, in the Bible, this happened. Jesus' last name was not Christ. (laughs) There wasn't a Joseph Christ and a Mary Christ, and then we had baby Jesus Christ. That's not how it was. Jesus' title is Christ. That's who he is. Christ is his title. Jesus was from Nazareth, so they call him Jesus of Nazareth, right? Or Jesus, son of Joseph. I would be Mark of Wellsville. (laughs) If I didn't have a last name, that's who I'd be. And Mary was from Magdala. And so there, Mary was called Mary Magdalene. And here's the cool part. In Magdala, Magdala, their primary export was dyes and textiles. We're talking money. Big deal, okay? Okay. And so she was a big deal. Mary was a big deal in Magdala. In many parts of the Bible, she is called Mary the Magdalene. Mark the Wellsville, okay? That means you're a big deal. I'm not saying I'm a big deal. She was known for this. And Mary wasn't from Wellsville. She was like from Beverly Hills. Big deal. Now that you know this, you look at her different, church. You look at her different. When you think about someone who who was possessed by seven demons, right, you think about someone who's like, you know, living under the bridge, jonesing for heroin, something like that. Someone who is a complete disaster, not somebody from the penthouse suite. That's not how you look at it. But the fact is this, church, they all need salvation. Both ends. See here, Mary is living large but full of darkness, And sometimes we look at success in people as meaning they ain't got no problems. Isn't it funny how money can cover things up? (laughs) It does. But Mary had everything she wanted, but she didn't have what she needed. She did not have what she needed. See, demon possessed doesn't mean that you're foaming at the mouth that your head's spinning around, spitting pea soup for all of you guys, might be from the 60s or 70s, whenever that was. It can just mean the enemy has control over your heart. That's what demon possessed could be. It could be that you are possessed by the demon of pride. It could mean that you are possessed by the demon of vanity. It could mean that you're possessed by the demon of lust. It could mean that you are possessed by the demon of the pride of life. All the success that she had in her life, she was still dark. And once she was saved, though, church, once she was saved, She could use all those things for the light. Mary could use all of her resources to help Jesus' ministry. And Mary showed up for work. 
She showed up for work. Next thing is this, number four, she showed the way. Mary showed the way. She shows up in name. 14 times in the scripture, eight of those times she was connected with other women. And so I want you to think about this. She kind of like had a posse. Mary was one of those girls like everywhere she went like, hey, come on girls, we're going this way. She was influential. She was contagious in her faith. She was someone who, who was a trendsetter. She, she was someone that people would follow. And so those things that once was used in a dark way for the enemy. She was controlled by the enemy. Now Jesus is at the wheel, and she uses those things to serve him. Some of you are just like that. You are influential. People will follow you. People will listen to you. But now what Mary would do is she would organize women to serve because she was grateful, church. And she's like, you know what, hey, if I'm going to church, you all are coming to church with me. That's how she did it. And she, she was this person who people would listen to. See, this was her attitude. She was using her influence for God's glory. And the cool part is she was making the devil pay for it, wasn't she? He paid that bill. You know, church, think about this. Wherever you are at your worst, is where God wants your light to shine. When you can relate to somebody else, when they've been through some really hard times, when they've been through some difficult times, you're like, I know what that's like. That's where you go and you let your light shine. Where you're like, yeah, I remember what that felt like. I remember what that is to be in that situation. And you go there. Church, that is the greatest place. Where you are at in your worst is where God wants you to shine your brightest. Because you can relate you understand. Fifth thing is this. Mary showed courage. Mary Magdalene showed courage. Church, she was at the cross. Front row seat, she was right there. You know, Peter wasn't there. He wasn't. He was off. He was out there. I doubt Thomas was there. It's a joke, church. It's the best one I got today. Come on. Don't make me laugh at myself. Doubting Thomas, get it? Okay, some of you guys are slow today. John, he was the only one who was there. He was the only one who was there. Remember, he's the one that was loved. So, of course, he's there. The other disciples, they were afraid they were next. They're like, I ain't going there. They ain't going to grab me and throw me up on there. They were hiding. But Mary was there. She was there, and she watched it take place. The, the next thing is this. Mary showed emotion, church. She showed emotion. She was a strong woman. She was a very, very strong woman, but she was also willing to show her emotions. Church, she was willing to be vulnerable. So strong on one hand, but not afraid to cry in public. On the other, church, every single one of us, we are leaders in some way, shape, or form. You all have a sphere of influence. It might just be your kids, but ooh, what an influence you need to be. But your power will be limited when you can't be in touch with both sides, where you can't show your strength, but also show your weaknesses. You know what drove me crazy growing up in the church is, is when preachers would sit there and preach and act like they had no weaknesses whatsoever, act like they had it going on. And I remember sitting there going like, I never live up to that. He must be perfect. You can reach so many people when you can be strong but also say, I'm weak too. I have struggles. I have issues, church. You can be strong, but also admit that you are weak. Next thing is this, Mary showed her true colors, church. She really did. She showed her true colors. When crisis arises, when there's a crisis that arises in your life, what you do is you stick to who you really are. You do. You might have a weak knee moment, right, where you're saying some stuff you didn't really mean, but all in all, going through that storm, it should not change who you are, church. It should show who you are. Anytime you go through a storm, it shouldn't change who you are, but show who you are, and that is what Mary did. She showed her true colors. Church, this morning, as I asked the praise team to come up here, for Mary, I want you to imagine this. It was the worst day of her life. The very worst day of her life. She, the one that she 
gave her life to in service. The one that she was so grateful to because of what he did, he was brutally murdered right in front of her. But you know what? She shows at her core that she is a follower of Jesus. She didn't let it waver her. She didn't let it knock her off her feet. She did what she had to do. Mary basically was like, you take my money. Go ahead, take it. You take my connections. You know what, guys? You can even put me on the cross next. I'm going to be here for Jesus. She basically had that attitude like, he changed my life. He saved my soul. And I'm going to give him everything I have. I'm going to give him all of it. Church, do you know where power like this comes from? I'm going to tell you right now. John chapter 20, I want to take you back, man. This can be very profound for you if you're paying attention and if you really want to understand it. In in John chapter 20, verse 13, it says they asked her, woman, why are you crying? And she said this, listen to me, church. They have taken my Lord away. She didn't say the Lord. She didn't just say Lord. She said they have taken my Lord away. He's my Lord. Church, I ask you today, who is Jesus to you? Is he the Lord? Or is he your Lord? My Lord. Can you speak in that way? Church, this is the most important question you will ever answer in your life. Is he your Lord? Is he yours? Not just a Lord. Not just somebody else's Lord, not my grandma's Lord, but is he your Lord? Where you can honestly stand and say, my Lord, Jesus Christ. Church, that is the most important question that you will ever answer. That possessive pronoun right there has the ability to change everything for you. Every single thing. My Lord. You know, Mary thought Jesus was a gardener disciples left her at the tomb Jesus says who you're seeking she's like where'd you put him she wants she wanted to know where's my Lord at where'd you put him I'll go get him right now church there will be nothing more powerful in your life nothing more powerful in your life than for your ears to being in tune to the shepherd's voice nothing more powerful I want to share one last verse with you as we get ready to wrap it up. It comes from John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 27 says this. My sheep listen. Did you hear what I just said? Are you listening? It says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. It means no matter what, church, what can be more important for you today than to be in tune with your shepherd's voice who calls you out daily? I mean, daily. Church, you realize Mary showed gratitude. She showed resilience. She showed courage. She showed the way. She showed her work. She showed emotion. She showed her true colors. If anything, I believe we could wrap all that up together and say this. Mary showed up. She showed up. She was there. She showed up to finance. She showed up to support. She showed up to praise his name even when the chips were down. She showed up to lead church. She showed up to influence. Because Mary knew this, church, that the show must go on. That this story of the resurrection, the story of the resurrection is the foundation of what we believe, and it must go on. It must continue to influence. It must continue to change. It must continue to inspire and forgive It's the answer to our problem, church. Salvation is all you need. At the end of the day, it's not about your monies, your homes, and your cars. It's about your salvation. And every single one of us will have to give an account. All of us. And so, I ask you today, is he your Lord? Can you make that statement, that's my Lord? And if you can't, The good news is this, you can do something about it right now. 
right now. Jesus has the power to transform in a second, in a moment. Church, in a heartbeat. He has the power to forgive. He has the power to put back together. He has the power to transform. And that power is only through recognizing him as your Lord and Savior. So this morning, if that is you, if you are not in Christ Jesus, I want to encourage you to let today be the day. Seriously, don't walk out of here. You come forward. There will be someone to pray for you and with you. And for the rest of you believers in Christ, I want to ask you this. Are you showing up? Do you want to be like Mary? Where you, I'm, I'm talking, you show up. Lord, what do you want? What do you want from me? I'm here to praise you. I'm here to honor you. I'm here to serve you, no matter what the cost. So how about it, church? Let's stand together. Let's sing. But I want to encourage you to respond this morning.